My guest today is Mark Passio. He is an independent researcher, radio talk show host, a public speaker, and also a freedom activist from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And he has assembled a vast amount of knowledge on occultism, uh, spirituality, metaphysics, symbology, and consciousness. You can find all of that information on his website, whatonearthishappening.com, as well as freeyourmindconference.com. And he joins me today to talk about occultism and mind control. So Mark, thank you for joining us today. I know we've got a lot to talk about in a short amount of time. So I wanted to kind of give a, a tripart question here first, uh, just kind of give a little bit of a backstory. I've heard you say in a few of your lectures that you were um, actually a practitioner of the dark occult. Obviously, this is where some of your expertise comes from. You can confirm that these occultic symbols are being employed. They do have power. But what does that mean? Um, what does that mean as far as you are practicing? Was that like Satanism, Luciferianism, some sort of other dark occult that I don't really know about? And then, of course, what compelled you to kind of seek out that knowledge and, and what was it that helped you kind of realize that maybe that wasn't wh where you wanted to spend your energies? Sure, that's a really great question. Well, in my youth, I kind of accepted uh, without much questioning a lot of the uh, religious dogma and indoctrination that I had been given by family members and school teachers. And I come from a, uh, a pretty standard Roman Catholic Italian background in South Philadelphia. And my family was kind of the type that never really uh, challenged belief systems, certainly never questioned authority, anything like that. Uh, and, you know, back then when I was given a lot of those dogmatic beliefs and kind of accepted them, uh, I certainly lacked a lot of the knowledge about uh, what religious indoctrination is about and why it's done. I certainly didn't know anything about astrotheology at that time. And um, a lot of that knowledge probably could have put some of that indoctrination into perspective. But since I lacked it, um, my um, disillusionment with uh, modern organized religion turned into extreme anger. And I acted upon that anger by uh, attempting to seek out the antithesis of religion, the antithesis of the system into which I was born. And I found it in the form of the dark occult, dark occultism, particularly Satanism, which was the type of dark occultism that I gravitated toward. And I espoused a lot of satanic beliefs and ideologies, uh, particularly through writing and music. Some of my work was eventually recognized by Anton LaVey, who was the high priest of the organization known as the Church of Satan at that time. He has since died. But uh, he asked me to uh, take part in the Church of Satan and become a priest within its membership. And uh, I accepted that offer, and I became a priest in the Church of Satan. And what my job was to do was basically, for the most part, um, explain the ideology of Satanism to people in, in an attempt to take more people into the ranks of that ideology. Uh, as my involvement with Satanism in general, not just the Church of Satan organization, grew, I became aware that this wasn't an isolated group of individuals that were just working with occulted or hidden knowledge in order to uh, essentially grow their own personal power, but they were groups, uh, inter-networked groups of, of people who were working together, uh, and they, were, they came from an, a, a, an eclectic array of, uh, of people from every walk of life, every social institution that you could imagine. There were Satanists placed in positions of high power and influence within those institutions, including politics, banking, law, military, law enforcement, entertainment, technology, medicine, education, and every other area of our lives. And they were not isolated individuals that were just trying to increase their own personal power and influence. They were working together as a tight-knit unit toward a common goal, and that common goal was to increase their own collective power at the expense of everyone else's rights and freedoms. When I became aware that that's what the satanic hierarchical network that is in place in this world was all about, that it was in fact about slavery, my 
consciousness, uh, my, my conscience, I'm sorry, uh, would not allow me to proceed any further with involvement in these groups. And I began to basically pull back from my involvement. And people will often say, well, weren't they extremely angered by that? And didn't they try to keep you in the group? Uh, you know, they were, they were uh, in initially trying to groom me for higher levels of involvement with other you know, network and think tank groups that, you know, go much higher into politics and certainly into eugenics operations. But uh, when I be became aware of what the overarching agenda of the, the whole satanic hierarchical network that's in place in the world was about, uh, I uh, desisted with my involvement in those groups. And people will ask, well, did they, didn't they try to reel you back in? Didn't they threaten you? Uh, they were absolutely unconcerned with my leaving. Uh, they simply basically said, there's nothing that you can do to change anything. We have people's minds and we have society right where we want it. And go and do your worst and tell people about what you know and that you're going to be banging your head against a concrete wall for the rest of your natural life. So go and do your worst because there's nothing that you could possibly do to hurt us. That was their attitude when I left. Right. Well, it, it is like banging your head against a wall. And, and there are such extreme forces keeping people hypnotized. I mean, just talking about Anton LaVey or the Church of Satan, uh, just the ties with the NSA. I mean, sure. if you want to talk about the surveillance and control, I mean, there is the upper echelons of government. And here was a secret program with the NSA that didn't, you know, didn't wasn't exposed until just recently. Obviously, it's been going on for quite some time. I consider the groups I was involved in very low level, certainly not high level by any stretch of the imagination. I do consider that LaVey was sort of a puppet for these higher level satanic networks and groups and certainly worked with governmental institutions during the time that he was alive. Uh, and, you know, most people don't really understand what the ideology of Satanism is. They think it's about devil worship. It has nothing to do with the worship of the Christian notion of the devil. Uh, this is, uh, Satanism basically has four main tenets or overarching principles of belief. And that is that self-preservation is the highest goal. And um, you should do whatever you can to advance your, your personal power and influence in the world, no matter who you really have to walk all over, step on, or hurt to get what you want. That's really the number one tenet. And if you look at society, most of society is stuck in that cutthroat, dog-eat-dog -dog mentality. Uh, moral relativism is the second major tenet, which is the idea that there's really no such thing as uh, objective standards of right and wrong behavior, that we as human beings can get to basically decide upon our whims what right and wrong are and, uh, you know, m base our actions accordingly. And if you look at most of society, I would say more people than not are moral relativists than moral objectivists who think that there is an objective standard of right and wrong behavior. So that's also very pervasive in society. The third major tenet is social Darwinism, the idea that the most ruthless in society have some sort of a predetermined or predestined right to basically rule over everybody else in society because their genetics got them there and you know, made them fit for rulership. And, you know, many people will actually think like that and think that that's okay, that that's just the natural order or the way things are, you know, so that's also very pervasive in our society. And finally, the fourth main pillar of, of Satanism is eugenics, the idea that those who are socially fit to rule and they're the, the fittest in society and therefore they've come out on top and they're ruling the roost, well, they can get to decide who basically propagates their genes and who does not, or in other words, who gets to live and who, who dies, who must die. Wow, that's incredible because that's obviously so many things that we're trying to expose here at InfoWars. And, you know, we talk about this self-preservation thing a lot, even when you see uh, these members of secret societies and how you think, how do these people literally get away with murder sometimes or awful things that are hidden, um, pedosadism, things like that, that you wonder how are these people in the law enforcement or politics, how are they these crimes being covered up? But it is this sort of secret society, self-preservation um, system that they have to protect each other and protect this, this overarching, um, you know, unforeseen hand that's sort of controlling everything. So what about these occultic symbols that are that they're using and kind of pervading our society. How, what's out there that you know of and how is it being used? Well, I think a good, uh, 
precursor to this would be to simply explain what the occult is, because many people hear that word and they really don't understand what it means, and they have an erroneous perception of what occultism in general is. The word occult is derived from the Latin language. It comes from the Latin adjective occultus. Occultus in Latin simply means hidden from sight. And, you know, the verb occultare in Latin, occultare, means to hide, to conceal, or to keep secret. So both of these words in Latin are in turn derived from the Latin word oculus. Oculus means eye. So it all has to do with what can be seen and what is not easily seen. That which is hidden from view, which is veiled from our sight, which is difficult to see because in many cases it operates in the realm of the unseen or the spiritual realm. And all that's all the occult is. The occult is knowledge that has been hidden for particular reasons, and we can get into what those reasons are, but it's knowledge that is hidden and held by very few people. And when you hide and uh, hold uh, very important knowledge uh, tight to yourself and you try to keep it sequestered from everyone else, what you are doing in that instance is you are creating a power differential through the knowledge differential that you've created. I mean, we've all heard the term knowledge is power. I would have a slightly different take, and I would say knowledge which is applied can be converted into real-world power. And that is what these dark occultists do, who are using this knowledge certainly not to uplift humanity. They're using it to create a power differential in the world so that they can stay entrenched in power, and they could take advantage of everyone else who is trapped in their ignorance. The occult is simply hidden knowledge held by very few people who exploit that knowledge uh, at the expense of all of the ignorant people, the ignorant masses who have no idea what that knowledge is or how it works. Now, the next question that would naturally come up for people is, well, what is the knowledge of the occult? What type of knowledge are we really referring to or talking about here when we talk about occultism in general? Occultism is a body of science, which is just not generally known to the wide body of human beings. It's hidden knowledge about two overarching fields of um, study of, uh, of human endeavor, and that is the human psyche the mind, and how the mind works, all of its inner workings and operations, okay? How the, the, the psyche actually operates, what human motivations are and how, how they work. I would call this the inner world, the inner world of the individual. And in the occult, this is often referred to as the, the lesser arcana, or the, the body of knowledge that constitutes the microcosmic world. In other words, the world of the individual, the, the psyche. Then there's a second body of knowledge that is about the greater spiritual laws that ultimately the entire universe is bound by and works according to. This would be considered the major or greater arcana of knowledge, or the macrocosmic world. This is knowledge about the spiritual laws of the universe and also the physical sciences because much of the physical sciences workings is also occulted and hidden from us so that our society doesn't progress and advance in ways that the people who currently uh, hold the reins of our society don't want it to. So we have to understand that there's a body of spiritual or what I simply refer to spiritual laws or what I simply refer to as natural law in my work that is a, uh, a part of the occult knowledge. It's the, a part of the macrocosmic knowledge that comprises what is known as the major arcana or the greater arcana of occult knowledge. Uh, that being said, those two bodies of knowledge really constitute everything that humanity needs to understand to become free. That's why it is hidden. That's why it is occulted, because the people who are currently enslaving humanity and who, who are currently running our society don't want to, the playing field to be leveled by this knowledge being understood by people. Because if people understood it in mass, they would be able to empower and free themselves from what is being done to them, from them being kept in the condition of human slavery as they are right now. Occult knowledge is neither good or bad. It's not 
uh, something that is inherently positive or negative. The consciousness of the wielder of that knowledge will ultimately determine whether that knowledge is actually being applied for good or ill. In other words, either for the uplift of humanity by spreading it and distributing that knowledge throughout the human population and therefore enlightening people and making them be able to be informed and make their own good choices and good decisions in harmony with the spiritual laws of nature, natural law, or whether that knowledge, that occulted knowledge, will be used for ill, for evil purposes, for control, for manipulation uh, over the people who currently lack it and are ignorant of it. And that's the difference that I would describe between light occultism or what I simply have come to call de-occultism, which is what I consider myself a de-occultist, someone who is trying to bring that hidden knowledge out into the light of day for all to see and understand, versus dark occultism. Dark occultists want to deliberately hide and keep that knowledge hidden in order to create and maintain that power differential that they currently have. Well, exactly, because as long as they can keep uh, a false reality, uh, people just kind of in a, a fog, um, no one can change the reality because they don't actually have a grasp of what reality actually is. They're just in a trance with all of this symbolism bombarding them everywhere. Obviously, um, the InfoWars viewers, they know all about, you know, the all-seeing eye and the right. pentagram and these sorts of things. Um, but this symbolism is, is in advertising, just basic advertising. Talk to me a little about that. Sure. It really goes quite deep. And I think this uh, example that I would like to bring up is going to really illustrate what the occult truly is and how it's applied in society uh, and how it works upon the psyche of individuals that have no idea about the symbols that are used against them. And they have no idea about the deep inner knowledge of the psyche that is wielded over them by people who do very deeply understand it. Uh, to understand this example, we have to just simply delve into the world of archetypes, uh, which are types of basically rudimentary type symbols. An archetype is uh, considered an original pattern from which other patterns or other more advanced type uh, uh, symbols are, are basically based, okay? So it's a model or an original form or a prototype of some kind. And uh, there's some basic symbolic archetypes. Of course, we have the circle, which represents infinity and eternity and perfection and the divine. The circle has always kind of been considered a shape that represents the divine. It's based on a number that cannot really be ever pinned down to e exactitude, you know, pi, of course. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it's just a symbol that repre has represented perfection uh, throughout all different traditions in human history. Conversely, Firstly, the opposite of that, the square, is another archetype, and it's represented stability, but um, also rigidity and imperfection. And it's represented things that are that are earthbound, that are very earthly and, and human, as opposed to, uh, you know, divinity, like the circle represents. Uh, so then we have another archetype, the triangle. You know, we see this a lot in symbolism as well, because it represents balance, it represents union or coming together of uh, often opposite extremes. It represents the intellect. It represents, uh, in many cases, knowledge. Uh, an ar another archetype is the star, which represents spirit or sovereignty. And, you know, that's, of course, used in politics a lot. And we, there's many other archetypes that we could get into, but essentially archetypes resonate deeply with the human subconscious mind. Okay, that's the main thing to keep in mind. It's kind of, archetypes are kind of embedded almost into our, uh, ver the very fabric of our being, into what one might call our ancestral DNA, because these shapes and symbols have been around with us since humanity has been on this planet. Um, uh, the perverted use of symbolism and archetypes goes on constantly in our society. And again, since people are ignorant about how a lot of the symbolism works, it's uh, quite literally a quote-unquote piece of cake for these dark occultists to wield this knowledge in this way. So I want to give a brief example. Uh, Betty Crocker uh, uh, in the 1950s was uh, had designed a new instant cake mix, and they uh, didn't know how this was going to be received by American housewives, and so they did a lot of research and development on this product, and they put it out into the supermarkets. They got distribution for it, spent a whole lot of money to, to do all of that. And then the cake mix was very unpopular. It did not sell well at all. 
And there was an underlying reason for this, but Betty Crocker didn't understand that reason at the time. Okay, well, I'll just give a little bit of a background. Um, they, they, this cake mix, all you needed to do was just add water to the supplied powder. And then, you know, you would bake that and you'd have an instant cake. In that day, that was considered somewhat of an amazing thing. And um, uh, unfortunately, housewives didn't go for it. They, you know, and families in general, they, they, did, they made kind of like a um, uh, a statement that th this isn't something that we're interested in by their purchase, by their lack of purchase. And Betty Crocker, instead of saying, well, you know, we've kind of received the mandate from the masses of people, they're not interested in this, uh, they decided that they would make people want the cake mix. Now, just think about that for one moment, okay? We're not going to say, well, we tried our product and it didn't work and people gave us a mandate that they're not interested in it and that's their free will choice and decision. No, 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 that's not good enough for us as a, as a corporation. We are going to do research not only into why people didn't want it, but what we will have to do as a company to make them want this very product. We're not going to go back to the drawing board. We're not going to abandon the idea. We're going to keep this out, you know, on the shelves and basically say, what are we going to have to do to modify this slightly to make people want it? So they hired a Madison Avenue ad campaign firm to investigate the, uh, which was basically comprised of a lot of psychologists. And they asked this psychological think tank team to find out through psychoanalysis the underlying psychological reasons that housewives didn't want the cake mix. The conclusion of this type of think tank study that came out was that while the average housewife at that time in the 1950s appreciated the convenience of the cake mix, they were feeling a very particular type of emotion by sort of taking a shortcut or cutting corners, whereas they had originally made cakes for their family from scratch and put a lot of their energy and effort and love into it. So the emotion that they, those housewives were feeling was actually guilt. That was the result of the psychoanalysis done by this think tank of Madison Avenue uh, ad campaign uh, firm, uh, um, think tanks, and uh, psych psychologists, actually. So what they had to do was attempt to dis, uh, assuage that psychological guilt in those housewives. The way that they did that, very interestingly, was they simply added some words on the instructions on the box. Now, just think about that for one moment. How powerful would a few words on a box be to completely change the mindset of an entire group of people in society? But that's exactly what happened. And this cake mix sold eventually. The three words that they needed to add on the box, so the ad campaign uh, firm comprised of these psychologists told Betty Crocker, just keep the mix the way that it is and add on the instructions, add an egg, add one egg where the three words need to be put on the box. When the housewives read the new instructions upon trying to find out how the cake mix work, worked before they bought it, um, that changed their mind. Now, most people will say, well, what sense does that make and how does that work? And therein lies what the occult actually is, what the knowledge of the occult is, which is what these psychologists applied. That's what we have to understand the occult is. It's deep, ancient, ancestral psychology that is being applied against people who have no idea about how it works. The egg is a symbolic archetype of feminine energy. It is the creative essence of the female that combines with the sperm to create life. It is the feminine fertility symbol. Mm. So that is what they were putting in the mind of the house housewife. Now you take what we've given you in the cake mix, the, the instant cake mix that's very easy to prepare, okay? And after you have that, you add an egg to the cake mix. So now symbolically, virtually, through proxy, you are giving your feminine creative essence into the project. And in doing that, that... Th those housewives are now assuaging that guilt that they previously felt by not putting enough of, quote unquote, themselves into this undertaking for their family to make this cake. In adding the egg, that psychologically assuaged that guilt subconsciously without 
those women ever even understanding what had been done it, through the back door psychologically to them. That, ladies and gentlemen, is what the occult actually is. The cake mix sold like wildfire after they only changed the instructions on the box to add a symbolic archetype to assuage that psychological guilt subconsciously. Wow. Now, if that's not, I mean, a powerful enough example, I don't know what is. This is what people have to begin to understand that occult knowledge is and what it can do and how it can be applied in a perverted way in society to act as sort of a weapon against people that don't understand how it works. I would suggest that's much more than just clever uh, advertising or clever marketing techniques. I would suggest that that is an absolute um, perversion of someone else's free will decision-making processes because you are using knowledge that they lack to essentially steer their mind in a particular particular direction without them even understanding how you did that. Absolutely. And obviously that was decades ago. No telling how perverse this is in advertising now. Um, you know, we see it with the with the commercials, McDonald's, Burger King, fast food. You know it's bad for you, but you've just got to go to the drive through right now. And Rob Dew actually did a report on uh, GMOs. There were a lot of activists calling for labeling for GMOs. And then they took them to this sort of think tank uh, meeting. And by the time they got out of it, they were all pro GMOs. So it's just it's just pretty amazing how easily we can be programmed. Um, obviously, I know you've got a ton more information that people can find on your website, uh, what on, what on earth is happening.com. But just in the last few minutes, is sure. there any advice on how to avoid all of this, or is it all just a matter of educating yourself to the reality so that you can, you know, avoid being brainwashed, basically? Well, I would say like any other aspects of problem solving, in looking for a solution to what we're facing today in our world, which is uh, certainly about mind control and occultic manipulation of the human psyche. Uh, through knowledge that is being perverted and exploited. Uh, the first step is to recognize that the problem exists and to begin to understand not only that the problem exists, but what are the causal factors of that problem. I would suggest deep ignorance is one of the largest causal factors of the problem that we face as a species. We could talk about the symptoms, you know, and all the different aspects of society that are broken until we're blue in the face, but they're really symptoms and they're effects of the underlying causes. We need to stop trying to treat the symptoms and we need to get go into the realm of consciousness and the understanding of this uh, heretofore occulted information, this occulted knowledge, because it's knowledge that has been hidden about how we work. That's some of the most important knowledge that there is, is self-knowledge. And then the other knowledge that's been hidden is the, the knowledge about how the universe works, particularly the spiritual laws of the universe. See, when we start to understand the causal factor lies in ignorance, we're making a diagnosis about the causal factors of the problem. We're not just treating the symptoms. And if you just look at the word diagnosis, that's the first step of healing. You've got to make a diagnosis about what's wrong. Uh, dia in Greek is a prefix that means through or by way of, and then the word gnosis in Greek means knowledge. So we're going to get to the solution by way of knowledge, through the knowledge of the causal factors of the problem, then we can understand how this manifested condition that we've arrived at called the current human condition, which so many people will say we do not want to be present and we want to get out of this current condition of slavery and control, okay? We can't do that unless we have an accurate diagnosis through knowledge of what the causal factors that created that manifested condition actually are. And in a nutshell, the answer to that, the knowledge that we need to understand is are those spiritual laws of the universe, what I simply term natural law. And my working definition for that is the universal non-man-made 
binding and immutable conditions that govern the consequences of human behavioral choices. So they're universal. That means they're, th these laws exist everywhere in creation. There is nowhere that you can go to escape them. They are in effect and you are bound by them. They're non-man-made. They weren't put into effect by any beings in the three-dimensional world in the universe. They were put into effect by the creative force in the universe. Call it God, call it the underlying intelligence behind everything. It doesn't make a difference what you call it. It's the creative energy that ultimately began everything and set the laws of this realm into motion that we call the physical universe. These laws are binding and immutable. That means they're in effect whether we understand them or whether we like that they're in effect or not. And we can do nothing to change that these laws are in effect, just like we can't change the law of gravity or the laws of electromagnetism. They are in effect in the universe and they are always in effect. We are bound by them. We only can understand their workings and then choose whether to align our behaviors to those workings or not. And they, what these laws, these spiritual laws ultimately do is they govern the consequences of our behavioral decisions. When we make a choice that is in keeping with these spiritual laws, therefore that behavior is actually a right under this natural law or spiritual law, then we receive one particular set of results. When we act in opposition to these laws and therefore we are acting immorally and we are not taking behaviors that are our right to, to take, we receive a completely different set of results. It's very, very simple. I simply call the, this the laws that govern whether a society is free or not, the law of freedom. Freedom and morality are directly proportional to each other. As morality increases in any given society, the freedom of that society will also increase. As morality in any given society declines or goes on the wane, then the freedom of that society will also decline, and it, that society will go ever more toward tyranny and enslavement. True wow. freedom can never exist in a society that embraces the concept or the ideology of moral relativism. This is the main problem that is driving our society into tyranny and slavery. Moral relativism, again, is the idea that there is no inherent and objective difference between right or wrong behavior. So humanity may be the arbiters of that. We can decide what right and wrong or, or decide for ourselves through our whims, our likes, our preferences, what right and wrong are for ourselves, that they're not objective standards of behavior that are set in spiritual law. So the real solution is to understand understand natural law, the universal spiritual laws that govern the consequences of our behavioral choices, whether we choose morality or immorality. The only way we're ever going to get out of this mess that we've worked ourselves into is to become truly moral beings and to increase morality throughout our entire society. That's when we'll make progress toward true freedom. Yeah, and that's really powerful because you can see that that's what is happening to our society right now. We have become very waning more toward the immoral side, and you see the tyranny is rising. It's kind that's of working right. perfectly into their plan. Well, Mark, thank you so much. We're definitely going to get you back on uh, to decode the matrix and, and other things there um, that are Great. just so interesting. But if you want more information, whatonearthishappening.com. Mark Passio, thank you so much. Leanne, thank you so much for having me on the show today. Stick around because right after this, we will be live in studio for our State of the Union coverage. City of Austin tap water versus filtered City of Austin tap water. I can like taste dirt in it. God knows what's in this. This has an aftertaste. Tastes like Austin water? Yeah, it does. Ugh. These people just sampled City of Austin tap water straight from the faucet. Next, we had them try a sample of tap water filtered through the ProPure G2.0 filtration system. I call it H2O. That one is better. Tastes like nothing. Yep, I know what good water tastes like. It's good water. Most tap water contains added substances like fluoride, chlorine, Monsanto's deadly pesticide, glyphosate, and many others. Studies prove that these substances are linked to an assortment of major health issues, including tooth decay, lowered IQ, and even cancer. It tastes like you're drinking out of the lake when you're drinking tap water. Yeah, it has uh, that uh, processed flavor to it. 
The ProPure G2.0 filtration system removes these deadly substances and many more, leaving only fresh tasting, deliciously clean water. Okay, this is very tasty. It's good water. Refreshing. It's good. <laughs> Go to InfoWarsStore.com today. Use promo code WATER and save 10% off your ProPure purchase. Again, that's InfoWarsStore.com or call 1-888-253-3139. You are watching the InfoWars Nightly News, which airs 7 p.m. Central at InfoWarsNews.com. And your support is helping us defend liberty worldwide.